Well, we are the only thing standing between you and cocktails, so we'll try to make this <laughs> worth your time. Um, we have an amazing group of women uh, this afternoon um, running incredibly interesting companies, um, doing very, very different things in different spaces, but I think we have a lot to learn from them on how they've differentiated and how they've stood out from the pack um, of a lot of competition uh, over the years. Um, love to start off just by asking all of you to spend just a minute or two describing your businesses to set the context, and then we'll, we'll dive right in. Um, starting with Nikki on my left, um, founder and CEO of Beyond Curious. Um, fun fact about Nikki, she actually speaks nine different languages, which I find fascinating. I don't know how you can learn that many languages. And she told me earlier, she actually used to speak 12 languages, which I don't understand how that's even possible. But Nikki, if you can tell me a little bit more, or tell us a little bit more about your business. Sure, in which language? <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Um, so um, I uh, founded a company called Beyond Curious, which is a digital transformation consulting firm. Uh, our focus is specifically on helping large multi-billion dollar companies adapt uh, and become more agile for the digital age. Uh, you know, most large companies are uh, like elephants. They're, they have this massive size and scale, but what they're lacking is speed. And so they have a really hard time adapting to change, which is getting faster and faster. And so we help them not only define the strategies, but also develop the technology capabilities and transform their culture for that digital age. Uh, so we often uh, describe ourselves as being in the business of making elephants run. Very cool. Um, and we have Rosanna, the co-founder and CEO of Carbon Robotics, fascinating business, um, which she'll tell us about. But fun fact about her, she used to rebuild old race cars with her father back in the day. Um, uh, great. So <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know what the facts were. We just knew that there was going to be Oh, yeah. I, I didn't even mention that. We did, like, myself. So I'm glad it was, like, not one of ten. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, so I'm with Carbon Robotics, and we build intelligent, low-cost robotic arms for manufacturing. So 90% of all of the tasks that could be manufactured today are actually done by hand. Uh, it's typically either econom economically not viable or the robots themselves are really dumb and don't know how to uh, understand their environment. So we've made a robotic system that's about 10 times cheaper for the total cost of ownership, and the robots can actually program themselves. So, they're, um, so they come knowing how to, how to do certain tasks out of the box. I asked her earlier, she brought a, a sample robot with her, and she says that they don't quite have uh, something that's portable just yet, but... Well, they are getting custom suitcases, so... Uh, okay, all right, so <laughs> soon, next time. Um, and last but not least, Isa Watson, founder and CEO of Invested. Uh, fun fact about Isa, she actually never had a cup of coffee in her life. I don't know <laughs> how she stays awake. Maybe she can share her how you uh, get through the day, but Lots tell us more about Invested. <laughs> Lots of tea. Um, so <laughs> Invested is an enterprise software company based in New York City. Uh, we've created a social workplace engagement tool. So our th central thesis is that connectedness is one of the biggest drivers of productivity and retention. And when you think about the new habits of millennials and how they form relationships, you know, companies have yet to kind of transcend that digital barrier of allowing them to do so throughout companies so that they'll stay longer, so that they'll have multiple careers within the company, and that, so that they'll be productive. Um, we focus mostly at this moment on progressive mid-market companies. So our, our customers are companies like Walmart.com and Jet and Vivo, um, Greenhouse, companies like that. And so, yeah, just a bit about Invested. All right, awesome. Well, so just to kick things off, I'd um, love to ask each of you um, just one moment, a defining moment um, in your careers, maybe it's with this company or, or another company, when you felt like you broke out of the competition, you, you were able to stand out in some way, shape, it might be an event, it might be um, uh, uh, just a brief moment of time, um, but what was that defining moment for each of you that you can think of? For me, it was um, looking at a slinky toy and realizing that that was the key. Um, so I'd spent about 15, 20 years of my career in the digital space um, helping large global brands. Um, but most of these programs that I was doing, they, were, uh, they took years uh, to implement, and they were millions of dollars. right? So, and they were all done the same way, going from point A to point B in a straight line. And by the time you get to point B, Three to five years have passed, millions of dollars have been spent, um, and the world around you has changed. Competition is different, technology is different, customer expectations are different. So by the time you get to your destination and you're celebrating your successes of the launch, you've effectively invented the past, not the future. 
And that struck me as really odd. And meanwhile, I was living in Silicon Valley, looking at all these incredible startups that were just constantly agile and innovative. And I thought, what if there was a way to package the, you know, what startups do so well and um, help large companies think and act with the agility of a startup? And I was actually looking at a slinky toy, and I thought, that's the key. How do you constantly you know, uh, run two races at the same time, the business you have, which you have to keep optimizing, but also invent the business you need to be in and experiment constantly, try out new things, um, you know, operate not with armies of people, but with agile Navy SEAL pods. Um, and that moment was really defining for me that kind of had that light bulb go off of taking that secret sauce, developing a methodology that could be applied and is effective in large organizations. And that's been the core of what um, everything we've done and done very successfully for large global brands. Awesome. Rosanna. Yeah, so for us, it's, it's an interesting question because I think when you have a young, uh, when you have a startup, differentiation is existential. Um, you cannot have a company if you're not sufficiently differentiated. And it can't be, your product can't be 10% better, it has to be 10 times better. And so when you ask the question, I'm thinking about what is the, what was the moment? Because at each point when we've made a product decision, we've had to say, how much better is this? Um, I do think that one of the things we've done a little bit differently that took uh, that, that, that wasn't initially comfortable for us was taking a much more human-centric uh, approach to our design. So a lot of people are in robotics, they think, about, they think about it from an engineering perspective, and we went out and we said, let's, put, let's forget about the technology, let's forget about the product for a second and look at the person. And that was something that hadn't actually been done and was really w was surprising to us, and it ended up being really compelling when we were meeting pilots. I have to piggyback off of that because um, when we first put out when we put out our first product, it was essentially we were responding to a feature request list of things that people said they wanted. Mm -hmm. And enterprise, everyone knows enterprise software is like one of the least sexy, you know, categories of you know things and businesses. And enterprise software ends up being very clunky. It's very functionally driven. And so what's every single piece of functionality you want it, let's throw it in the product and let's kind of neglect the user experience. And you know the engagement in our first product reflected that. And so what we did is that we changed kind of how we were listening to customers. You know, we have our buyer and we have our end user, and we took a people-centric approach. And we said, okay, we're not selling a feature list. We're not a feature shop. We really need to understand the user experience that we need to create, and um, kind of changing that to a more people experience, user experience oriented platform. Um, our engagement has is five to eight x anything in our industry category. The percentage of employees that adopt our platform, and also about ten x the percentage of employees that actually use our product monthly. And so that was a really defining moment, kind of changing who we listen to, and you know the approach, you know, to actually the design. Cool. So we, we live in a world now where there's three hundred fifty thousand tweets per minute. I mean, that number's staggering, right? Um, <laughs> and everything is changing so rapidly, so it's so dynamic. Um, so you're able to stand out, obviously, in this point in time. Um, but how do you actually stay ahead, right? How do you continue to stand out with all of this noise, all of this competition, constantly trying to get their message out there? Um, it's certainly a huge challenge for us. I'm sure uh, is a big challenge for you guys. Whoever wants to answer, um, you can just chime in. So for us, I'd say. Um, when we think about differentiation, there's the product, which is the visible piece of it. It's, it's what, you, what you see. Uh, but we really think less about how do we build a differentiated product and more about how do we build the team that can continue to differentiate the products over the next 10 years. And I think, so when uh, Michael Bloomberg was talking earlier about focusing for that first uh, 90 days on building the team, it, it made a lot of sense because you have to assume that people will. If your product's any good, they'll knock it off. If it's not good, then it doesn't matter anyway. Um, and so when you're working in that environment, you constantly have to keep thinking, what is the team? What are, and what are the core characteristics too? Like who are the people that feel so strongly that they need to get this expression of what they do out into the world and that they have such meaning around helping people? And when you can start to assemble that with all of the skill sets, then what we're looking at is not like differentiation. We're looking at a differentiation factory. And uh, so that's how we approach it. 
Absolutely. Great. Another thing I'll add to, to team is about, I, I do think that there are products that can be created and they don't end up reaching you know, the right demographic to engage in the product. And so with a lot of markets being crowded and a lot of noise, you know, there's a narrative that's shaped about you really quickly. As soon as you tell someone about your company, I think that um, the first thing they do is try to box you. And for us, that was being boxed with employee engagement. So we have a room full of CEOs. How many of you guys have been sold a platform on employee engagement, pitched a platform on employee engagement? Most people. Um, and so, but we're actually not necessarily an employee engagement platform. If you unpack the industry, it's actually employee engagement surveys that's taken up a lot of the noise. And so, we talked about this a little bit, but how do you change the narrative? And I think that, you know, people are always, you know, preaching that things are streamlined, they make your job easier, but what's the deeper issue? And so, that's one way that we've you know, try to rise above the noise um, to talk about workplace engagement, to talk about retention, to talk about the fact that when you have a friend at work, your likeliness of staying goes up by multiples, um, and you're able to deliver a lot more to the company in a day and age where people are staying at their jobs an average of three years, mm -hmm. um, and that turnover cost gets high. And so that's actually the core issue for these companies. And so I think changing the narrative is another way to, to rise above and not necessarily focusing on the surface, but what are the deeper level issues that you're addressing? Um, for us, um, it was really based on two things, um, two ideas that have defined our differentiation. One is um, I founded the company based on our purpose and mission statement, which has really been core to not only how we engage with the customers and even the customers we choose to work with, as well as the team members that are part of uh, the organization. Um, our mission is to unlock the limitless potential of people and organizations. And, and that idea has informed not only how we do business, um, but also looking at a completely different frame of reference instead of looking at the services business model or the services industry for um, inspiration, we looked at completely different industries. So we looked at the hospitality industry and what client experience can be like um, based on hospitality. We looked at um, you know, the um, education industry and how you develop people. So we looked at completely different <coughs> frames of references all in the pursuit of that purpose and being alive. Uh, true for our employees and true for our customers. So that part has remained constant throughout. What we constantly uh, challenge and uh, sort of push the envelope on is how do you disrupt yourself before you get disrupted and redefine what that mission means in a completely different context. Because what it meant five, six years ago, frankly, is different from what it means today. So you can open up completely new services or product offerings if you stay true to that mission but rethink your ability to fulfill that. So, you know, typically I think people think of standing out from a, a competitive perspective, but I think um, we keep hearing time and time again, talent continues mm -hmm. to be one of the biggest challenges uh, for all of us, uh, whether it's engineering talent or um, really anyone in the organization. It's pretty ruthless. Uh, they live out in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, the, the salaries that Google and Uber and Facebook are commanding are absolutely ridiculous. Um, so sometimes it's, it's hard to, to push your mission forward and have your mission stand out in a way that attracts talent into the organization. I think there are other reasons why you want to stand out also. Mm -hmm. So how else do you, uh, what are other ways you look at like standing out? I mean, uh, people is obviously one example of that, but why else? Do you feel like you need to stand out from whether it's your competition or even companies that have nothing to do with you, but you're competing for their resources? Well, I think for, for us, the first issue is actually is around talent, and that's yeah. one of the key areas. So there are not that many roboticists in the world, <laughs> not that many computer vision engineers, and they can all make a lot more working somewhere else. Um, and so what we do is we make sure that we are very, very clear about what we're doing and why it matters. And we throw them into the situation where they know when they're coming in, we say, look, we only want you to join if you're ready to do the best work of your life. Mm -hmm. And if you were willing to put so much of your heart into this that the product that we make will really change the world. And that doesn't resonate with everyone. Mm -hmm. But when it does resonate, it's a really, really big deal. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about recruitment, we don't really think about it as uh, uh, getting people to join our company. We think about it as finding our tribe. 
and when we find our tribe, then we're just kind of sending off the signals. And so I think it's worked out really well. We've balanced certain skill sets with, with mindsets, and I think that's, that drives into building a differentiated product, but it also means that people feel drawn to what we're doing, and they know, they know that's, that's not just something that we believe, it's who we are, and, and they feel that way too. The one thing that we do a little differently is we have a little bit of a little bit more fluidity among roles than mm -hmm. other companies. So we, you have your engineers and you have your customer su support um, team and you have your product managers. But the one thing that we do is we characterize our roles in the context of superpowers. So if you're a PM, that's your superpower, right? And you will you'll you know lead product, you will do product well, and you should be committed to that. Um, but the one thing that we do is we engage the team members at various levels in some of the really important decisions about you know, the product direction and the company's direction. Um, we actually have practices like having engineers do customer support you know, for an hour a month, having um, you know, our content and community managers actually do user research interviews. So we try to get people to um, you know, gain exposure around the, uh, the, the multitude of things that, that make the business. And the other thing I'll say is that um, just from a pure diversity standpoint, I think that a lot of times we, we think about diversity in the context of race and gender, but it's really about experience and it's really about your unique perspective. Um, I'm a, I started my career as a metabolic diseases chemist. You can put another woman next to me and she's not gonna have the same perspective I have because of my background. And so, you know, enabling the top of the funnel of ideas to be very plentiful and diverse is really key. And I think having a diverse team um, and enabling them to continue to grow their perspectives as they're working with you and helping you to grow the company is another way to differentiate yourself on the talent side. And not everyone loves that. You know, some people just want a predictable job where they can come and do the nine to five thing and that's, that's cool, but that's not us. And so we're kind of unapologetic about it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, for us, you know, uh, being in a services business poses an additional layer of challenge because you're not only competing for the same data scientists and uh, designers and engineers that the Googles are competing for, but you don't have the unicorn sort of, you know, uh, equity to give out uh, in the same context. So. Um, what has worked uh, exceptionally well, much like Rosanna talked about, is um, you know leading with purpose and being truly authentic in your culture because the right people uh, gravitate towards that. When your business feels more like a movement that people are opting into, that tribe becomes unstoppable in what they can achieve. And and then you we focused a lot on investment in that because uh, we launched Beyond Curious Academy, which is um, really designed around uh, unlocking the skill set and the mindset of uh, exceptionally smart people that are looking for not just how to do the job here, but how can they take those portable skills elsewhere. Uh, you know, when you think in the millennial context, it's so much about, you know, is it meaningful, is it portable, you know, is, is there value in it in the outside world? So how are you actually making them even better? Uh, in many ways, I think of Beyond Curious as a factory for great leaders. And so how do you develop that talent and, and uh, make them more successful? And when they're thriving, then the work product and the impact is bound to be there. But the other aspect is about diversity. Um, you know, I've often been called the poster child of diversity myself as an immigrant and minority and being uh, a woman and so forth. And, um, but you know, that when you have that platform, you have to uh, use your voice to uh, make an even bigger difference. And so how do people feel like they're joining into that movement and feeling like they're part of something bigger than themselves. Um, so right now we're in the process of developing a global platform to um, educate uh, women and also provide employment in that. And so um, really filling that gap that's becoming bigger and bigger in both skills and diversity, mm -hmm. especially in women in tech. So switching gears for a second, um, when have you guys gotten it wrong? What, what struggles have you like had? Every I mean, day. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure we have lots of examples, um, but what's one you just, that comes to the top of your head is like, wow, I really thought this was gonna work. Like, I thought this would highly differentiate our company, but it actually did us a disservice. Um, I can yeah, share. Um, well, 
it, it's it's been uh, whenever we've gotten too comfortable or attached to an original idea that was a great idea to start with, but maybe stayed with it too long. Um, so you know, we got obsessed about making that one thing perfect and, and sticking to it. And meanwhile, the market had moved on, the competition had caught on, and we were still hankering on that. So there was this uh, sort of uh, choosing perfection over progress was certainly one area that, uh, you know, where we were left behind. And making that pivot got a little bit harder because the turns were more severe. Yeah, I think we, we can, I can definitely relate to that. I think uh, times that we've really messed up are when we've assumed that we know the answer and we may know 60% of it or 50% or zero or 100, but we've made this assumption that we, that we know what's right. And, uh, and then sometimes we've been right and sometimes we've been wrong. And so we actually made a conscious decision to build uh, a beginner's mind into everything we do in our process. So we say, we are probably dead wrong about this. We think we understand you. We may not. Tell us how we're wrong so we can be less wrong. And I think that that's probably been one of the best, one of the best factors to help us stay pretty humble and also really open and creative. But then it also has to be tied to high stakes. I think one of the challenges that bigger companies face when they try and do internal disruption is the stakes are too low. It's not life or death. And, and so you're often you're at this situation where you are penalized for taking risks in the short term, but the, the long-term risk isn't, isn't really that big of a deal. Whereas at a younger company, it's the opposite. So you, you want to make all of those little mistakes. You want to be pushing it so that you're doing something different, but you also have to know that if we don't get to this point together, we die. And I think that that's really helpful and galvanizing. And so I think that, in, I think that with your question, there are so many ways that you can build in your expected failures into your process. Mm -hmm. So our platform is, I told you guys, social workplace engagement, but it's something like a, a LinkedIn, a Meetup, and an Eventbrite for companies. So a central repository for all events and activities going on, employee-generated, company-generated. Um, there's a volunteer component where you can access local things going on. And then there's a group component where you can actually tap into um, new relationships by mutual interests. And the one thing that we did early on is that we focused super heavily on the volunteer and, and CSR side because everyone was talking about volunteering and CSR. And we were like, oh, they have budget for that, so let's build to that. And we weren't, again, listening to the right people. And what we, what we found was that um, actually they, people started using our platform for events and activities, mm -hmm. um, just general workplace things going on. And so that was one thing where we, we were kind of like, okay, maybe we were listening to the wrong person. But the other thing I'll say from that, and it's kind of tapping back into my you know, science days as a researcher, but in experimentation is key. It's core to our DNA. Um, I was, I listened to Jeff Bezos um, talk about this last fall, and one thing that he said is that it's funny how people think Amazon is so successful because they actually fail a whole lot. It fell way more than they succeed. And so we actually sit down as a team in our product deep dives on Thursdays and we go around what are the key things that we've learned this week. And if our learnings aren't big enough, we up the stakes and we increase the frequency of our experiments. And mm -hmm. so um, that's one thing that we got wrong, but also how we've kind of come back to course. And I think that to your point, yes, we literally fell like every day and every week. And I think mm -hmm. that is kind of part of the game. Well, I know we're right at our time. Maybe just quick words of part, uh, parting advice from the three of you. Um, for the audience, I know everyone here is everyone trying to differentiate their companies from the pack. Um, if maybe in just a few words, uh, you guys can just tell the audience what what you think they should do. Um, it, it's um, it's truly a an important time in society uh, for every business and for every business leader to take a bigger view of the platform that we have. Uh, to stand for something and to create profound impact. And when you think of your um, purpose in that sense, that is true differentiation that nobody can take away, nobody can compete with, and that's what draws in um, the customers, the employees, and everybody that wants to be part of that. And so I would say, uh, you know, uh, authentic purpose-driven leadership, uh, there's no better time than this and no more important time than this for each of us uh, to stand up and be that. I love that. I think that's great. Um, and I love what you said earlier about it being a movement. Um, I think that 
if there's one thing that's the most important to us, it's probably what we opened with, which is that it's not enough to just differentiate with a product because that just exists for one moment and you should consider it obsolete the moment it's out. You have to build a team that can consistently differentiate because your product will always be downstream from the team. And uh, so if we're investing in any piece of, that, of, of, of what we're doing, we're investing in the team, in the individuals, and how we work together. Great. My biggest piece of advice is really around experimentation. Mm -hmm. The point I just made, and not being afraid to experiment. I think people have this misperception that you can only experiment if you're smaller. You know, before I did this, um, before I started Invested, I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase in the program that Jamie Dimon had created to facilitate kind of more mini Jamie Dimon. So we were kind of general managers going across the firm, and that's that's a quarter million people in that firm, and we were able to still. I led a number of you know experiments, and I think that you know just being conscious of that. And someone said something earlier today, be married to the problem and not the solution. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we latch onto the solution, we try to you know, navigate and experiment with the solution, but it's really about the problem and kind of like taking it, taking it back to that. Well, great. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you to our audience and Bloomberg for, for hosting a really fantastic day. Um, and hopefully we'll see all of you guys over, over some cocktails. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.